So with web apps, what are some of the limitations of a browser side model? Um, the thing that we found is um, the, f the first step where we wanted to improve performance on Twitter.com is um, you know what anyone should do. We measured a lot um, and really sort of tried to find out um, what the experience was like for our users across different browsers, uh, different parts of the world, different machines. Um, and one thing that we were surprised to find is that uh, on our very sort of client uh, JavaScript heavy fra um, framework that we were on at the time, uh, it just, we spent a lot of time chewing JavaScript and obviously you don't notice it when you're, you're on like a MacBook Pro in San Francisco sure. <laughs> using Chrome. Right, um, right. But, uh, you know, a company like Twitter, we have users all over the world in all different situations and, and, and sort of one of our company objectives is to um, sort of, uh, be everywhere for, you know, all our users. And, and so we really wanted to get to those people with the, the less good browsers and we found out what we were essentially doing is putting the, a lot of the experience and the performance of our app in the hands of these you know less good machines mm -hmm. um, and we really wanted to be able to take back control of our own performance and, and render stuff back on our servers where we can centrally optimize and improve the experience for everyone so um, that was that was the big thing um, certainly um, we wanted to kind of I suppose use the right tools for the right job as well and, and often you use a lot of JavaScript um, and end up breaking how the browser would work by default or mm -hmm. breaking how HTTP works and then you kind of recreate it in JavaScript and, and it ends up with being a less optimal solution than what you previously had. So we wanted to kind of take it back, simplify it and, and basically go with as little JavaScript as possible and as simple JavaScript as possible, you know, to deliver the, ex the same experience that we have now. How can bro uh, developers take advantage of browser features without depending on them? Um, uh, something that um, I've advocated for most of my career is, is progressive enhancement. Mm. Um, and I, I've yet to come across a situation where progressive enhancement not only allows you to give uh, take uh, advantage of the newest technology and still have a reasonable experience for, for you know the downgrade users uh, downgrade browsers and all that yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it's just a way of thinking and, and in a sense I, I I see it as like a foundational thing where you uh, if you have the HTML and the basics all in place and then you layer the more sophisticated stuff on top um, it, it's it, it tends to it ends up being like a better and, and more robust design mm. as well as allowing you to be able to just deliver really high-end experiences to high-end browsers and, and, and good enough experiences to lower-end browsers now a while back you had a post where you concluded that hash bangs are destructive to the web why is that um, so there are a few reasons, really. Um, one, uh, where can we start? Um, <laughs> so I suppose it, the, the, the premise in the, in the blog post is um, URLs are important to the web. They're, they're what make the web the web. It's, it's a, a linked uh, set of resources. The link and the identifiers for a resource is the URL, um, browsers, um, search engine crawlers, everything basically runs uh, you know with URLs is at the very heart of it and that uh, you also want to be able to keep your URLs around and not make and make sure that you're not breaking links across the web mm -hmm. so you want your URLs to be forever um, and the hash bang is you know um, n everyone even the kind of proponents of the hash bang would admit that it's a hack now, URLs are not the right place for a temporary hack because your URLs need to be forever. Um, and, and essentially, the Hashbang URL um, is locking you to, into a situation where the only way that URL is meaningful is if there happens to be a piece of JavaScript running and a user agent that can run that JavaScript. Okay. Otherwise, it means absolutely nothing. 
Um, so you get this kind of follow follow on problems where um, you kind of give up being able to use HTTP redirects and right. being able to send 404s and all of that kind of stuff as well because any URL, whether it points to a resource or is or it, or it doesn't, what you have to do is deliver uh, the JavaScript with a 200 code and then the mm -hmm. JavaScript can only then work out whether this resource points to a real thing or it's or it's a missing thing. So sure. you can never even like send a redirect to put, uh, you know, HTTP redirect to send people to the right place. You can't even send a 404 uh, to say that this content isn't found. You've, you've basically introduced something that breaks. Yeah, you've broken the, the web, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in essence. Uh, now, and then I suppose the hard thing then is it's very difficult if you want to keep those, those hashbang URLs alive, it's very difficult to go back. Right. Um, yeah, because, like I said, the only re the only way that they are meaningful is uh, for some JavaScript to execute. And so, for us at Twitter, we are going to continue support to support those URLs and redirect to the the newer style URLs. Right. And and the only way we can do that is leave a little piece of JavaScript on our on our web page forevermore. So, I suppose what I wanted to do with that blog post is just warn people that. Yeah, you think it's a temporary hat, it's not very temporary. Right. And please don't go down that, that route. It's got repercussions. So, uh, last question for you, it's related to what you were talking about. Do you, do you feel that the URL is the most important part of the web? And if so, does it get the attention that it deserves? Um, it might be, I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's certainly important and I, and I think it's, uh, especially in the sort of the new uh, JavaScript MVC uh, centric sort of world, um, it's kind of I feel like it's undervalued, and um, mm. but probably in more a wider sense where um, you know, like I was saying before, URL um, the web, the reason why the web is the web is that it's a collection of linked resources, and they all have a unique identifier, and they can all be linked together, and. Um, that's what's made web applications good. It's not that they're a desktop application delivered over the web, it's that they are an application that's of the web. You know, if you take something like Flickr or um, where, where you know, it has a really nice URL structure, structure and, and that maps to distinct mm -hmm. entities and, and it has a, an API that people can consume which points back to all of those URLs. It's, um, that's the kind of service which, which I think is which is part of the web rather than um, you know a, a JavaScript MVC app. It, it's kind of like a little. It's all on one page and it's just yeah. a desktop style app, just delivered in its own little world and its own little shell, and mm -hmm. not as connected and not as part of the web as as, as the sort of more you know like the Flickr traditional style web sure. application. And I think. There's, there's use cases for both. Um, I just think that I'd, I'd love for people to realize that web apps that are, are of the web, um, they're not a thing of the past that are going to be replaced by desktop uh, apps, or, you know, desktop style apps. They have their, they have their place and right. they're part of what made the web successful. Interesting. Well, thanks a lot for being with us. Appreciate it.